This evening, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to explain the complicated story of how the United States got into World War I. While we're discussing this, I want you to think about a few things. And one of them is that the, uh, President Wilson, when he came to, when he was elected president and came to power, was an isolationist. Most progressives were isolationists. All of the, not all of, but a lot of the uh, imperialist, colonialist impetus that from the previous 20 years were, had kind of dissipated mostly because of the great problems the Americans had in the Philippines. And a lot of people were just simply not interested in whatever conflicts were brewing in Europe or, or anywhere for that matter. They also believed, Wilson was a, was a very idealistic person. Uh, actually, you could all, he was not a very pragmatic man in many ways. He was a college professor, president of Princeton University at one time. And he believed the United States being an exceptional uh, system of government should set an example in international affairs by becoming the champion of liberal democracy. The liberal democracy was the only way, only thing that worked, and, and col colonial powers were bad, and uh, great British, the kingdoms of Great Britain, the kingdom of anything, individual liberty was most important, self-determination, and when you also when you go when we go through this, I want you to think about how you can justify, if possible, American intervention in Latin America during Wilson's years in office knowing that what's at the top of the the first bullet here existed in his mind. Wilson promised to remain neutral. In the, in the summer of 1914 Europe erupts into the eventually called the war to end all wars which we know <laughs> that wasn't true and it's very interesting here and we'll go through the causes of how between 1914 and by finally by 1917 the actions of the United States and finally by 1917 actually entering the war against Germany, Austria, Hungary. And then uh, Wilson's 14 points. At the end of the war, in the fall of 1918, uh, the war ends and the, at the Peace Treaty of Paris or what we call the Versailles Treaty in 1919, Wilson proposed what they call 14 points, and it's it's something to keep in mind uh, as we go through these things. 14 very idealistic ideas. Questions to keep in mind: Over American a million Americans served in France and other foreign countries in World War One, and how it affected these Americans. Many, maybe even most who had never gone too far from their own hometown. Uh, now they were gone to a foreign country. There was a song, How You Gonna Keep the Boys Down on the Farm Once They've Seen Paris. And once they s begin to see that there is another world out there besides their little colonial places in Kentucky and the hills, hill countries of uh, upstate New York and Vermont, and they went out and saw the world. And before the war, hardly anybody ever went to Europe. On, only very rich people took the Titanic or immigrants coming from Europe to the United States. That was the case. The road to war. Great Britain, France, and Russia were fighting against Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Empire, and Italy. The war, the, the spark that begins the war is in June 1914, but the build-up to the war had been going on for several decades, principally a military arms race where the Germans in Kaiser Wilhelm II wanted to try to build up the German Navy to be at least par with the British Navy, which was the dominant navy in the world. Wilhelm was, uh, although he was the grandson of Queen Victoria, was extremely envious of his cousin uh, Prince uh, King King George, and uh, envious of everything about the British. Uh, you also remember that the Tsar Nicholas II was related to Queen Victoria. They were all related to each other, but Wilhelm comes out as the most militaristic, pompous, 
parading around in all kinds of silly uniforms with feathers all over and swords and very Germanic uh, the parades and that kind of thing. And he wanted to have as big a navy, as strong a navy that could beat the British. It never happened. There was a Baltic controversy, means simply that when Archduke Ferdinand, who was the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, the Emperor Franz Joseph was in those days was 80 years old, and his heir was Franz Ferdinand. When he dies, the Austrian-Hungarians demand, and he was murdered in his car in Sarajevo. Uh, and the Austrian-Hungarians demand all kinds of ridiculous, submissive, uh, requirements to the, to the to the Serbians that wasn't going to happen the uh, the Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany said he would back whatever the the Austrian Hungarians demanded the Austrian Hungarians were demanding of a Slavic people Russians are Russians Bulgarians Romanians Hungarians um, Croatians Roma uh, they are all of the Russians and uh, the Slavic people and the Russians were on the side of those people against the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and against Germany. By The Russians began to mobilize by the end of July. Mobilize meaning they bring in their troops up to the frontier and bringing all their reservists onto active duty. And the war just sort of, it sort of happens. Once they start mobilization, the Russians mobilize, then the Germans mobilize. And on your internet, you can find a series of letters written back and forth between Tsar Nicholas II and Kaiser Wilhelm II. Uh, they're, they're called the Willy Nicky letters because they were cousins. They were first cousins. And please don't mobilize because I can't stop my generals and that kind of thing. Uh, the British declare war on August 6th and the war to end all wars begins. It's a tragedy. I've walked the battlefields in France and in Belgium, the Passchendaele, the Somme, Verdun, that was the most disturbing one. Millions of people died. Very, they were not prepared for a 20th century industrialized war with uh, artillery that could fire huge ton, two ton shells, 25 miles, machine guns, barbed wire, the trend, it all bogs down into trench warfare because neither side, the French or the Germans, the French, the British, or the Germans could go anywhere. The Germans, when they fought the Russians, they just destroyed the Russians. The Russians didn't even have enough guns to give every soldier a gun. America's going to remain impartial. So the Americans are, in the, are selling uh, to who, anything to anybody who wants to buy it. Not necessarily military hardware, but food and... Now, you got to remember here, the Germans and the Irish, they hate the British. The Americans are trying to remain neutral, but the Germans cr create some problems with the atrocities, and particularly in Belgium. They are the aggressor. The Germans were the ones that moved to the border and moved to Belgium in and, and the, and the summer of 1914, and by the spring of 1915, there's, everything's stopped in, in uh, trench warfare. The Germans are the ones who uh, use submarines first time in, in warfare, which most people feel is a very unfair thing to be sneaking under the water and firing torpedoes, and they fire torpedoes at uh, merchant ships and a ship called the Lusitania, which goes down with some Americans on it in 1916. The United States is not prepared for war in any way. They have a very small army. The biggest thrill they got was chasing Mexican bandito Pancho Villa across the Mexican border. Never caught him anyway, so it wasn't, wasn't that good an army. And in 1916, Wilson is up for re-election. He gets re-elected. But in 1917, he explains his 14 points. Number one was to establish a League of Nations so that we would not go to war. We would sit down and talk about these things. And you can see today, eventually that didn't work in the 1920s and 30s. But by 1945, at the end of the Second World War, we have the United Nations, which is still in effect 68 years later. Uh, just this past week, uh, President Obama was at the United Nations. The the leader of Iran was at the United Nations. Uh, it, it still works somewhat. 
No colonialism. Wilson said at the end of the war that all countries who had colonies, including the United States, should give up their colonies, which infuriated the British and infuriated the French because they valued their colonies even though uh, the colonies cost money. We must have free trade and freedom of the seas so that everybody in the world can, of course the Americans, the United States is the most industrialized country in the world and they want free trade and freedom of the seas to be able to sell their products everywhere. Then along comes two things. The Russian Revolution in March of 1917 was not the Bolshevik Revolution that happens in October. But the people of Russia overthrow the Tsar. He is forced to abdicate. And abdicate means he quits and he has to go under guard out and they eventually uh, they murder him. The, the, the Bolsheviks in, 19, in eight, 1918. But in March of 1917, there's a government, uh, the guy's name was Alexander Kerensky, but he could never, he withdraws from the war. We're not going to have any, we're not going to support the war. He tries to fight with the war, but it becomes a stalemate. And then in October of 1917, the Bolsheviks take over. In the spring of 1917, German submarines begin sinking American ships. They said they wouldn't, but then they did. So in 1917, Wilson goes to Congress and has a, declares war on April, 16, April 6th, 1917. After three years of stalemate, meaning no one can take too much territory, the other one takes it back again, millions are killed or died of disease, probably more died of disease. Great Britain is on the verge of starvation and bankruptcy. Germany is on the verge of the edge of bankruptcy. The Bolshevik Revolution pulls Russia out of the war. The United States is in the war. During 1917, they didn't do much. The war was kind of like not a lot of activity. The United States instituted uh, selective service, the draft we call it. Three million Americans joined the Army, two million in the Navy and Marine Corps. The U.S. Army and the whole expeditionary force is led by General John Pershing. The Americans in the early spring of 1918 did get into some battles. I've been to the cemetery at Chateau Tari and in the Argonne, and the war ends. Why did the war end? It was because the European countries were absolutely exhausted. Germany was bankrupt, starvation, People uh, dying of medical, uh, no medical attention. The troops were rebelling on in the fronts. The, there are in, were instances of the French army rebelling against ordering me to attack anything anymore. Uh, it was just, it was too much, and it was the, it wasn't the number of Americans that were brought to France. It was simply that the Americans were there, fresh troops, well, very well equipped troops. And the Germans, they tried one last offensive in the spring of 1918. It failed, and they knew that, that they would have to sign a peace treaty. So they signed an armistice. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of 1918, an armistice was signed. That doesn't mean that the French march into, and the Americans march into Germany. It means we stop right here. Wilson's 14 points again Post-war boundaries will remain where they are. There's no one conquers anyone's territory because that causes problems. But And then the new nations to replace Austria-Hungary and Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire was the Turkish Empire. No secret treaties, which led to the one of the reasons for the beginning of World War I. Nations would reduce armaments. Germany would have to get rid of its navy, sink all the submarines, its large battleships. Could, no, could not have an aggressive air force with fighter planes and had to limit the number of infantry and army troops and the creation of a League of Nations. They went to Versailles and someday if you haven't been you must. When you go to Paris you go outside the city and there's the humongous huge palace of Louis XIV and there's a huge ballroom it's called the, the Hall of Mirrors. And they held the, the peace treaty there, the meeting. Clemenceau for France, Lloyd George for Great Britain, Orlando for Italia, and Wilson, Woodrow Wilson was representative of the United States. 
the main issue of the of the Versailles Treaty and one of the main causes of World War II were the reparations. Germans were forced to sign a document that they would pay billions of dollars to the French and the British. The French and the British were not going to just say, okay, the war's over, let's all go home. They wanted to be paid back. And they had the Germans in a very weak position, and the Germans really had no choice but to sign the Versailles Treaty. And that was the beginning of World War II, 20 years later. Everybody goes back home. Everybody starts building up their armies again. A little guy, Mussolini, becomes director, or titled, or the, the leader in Italy. And by 1920s, and then by 1933, Adolf Hitler takes over in Germany. And by September 1st of 1939, third, 20 years later, you've got World War II, caused by the Paris Peace Tr Conference, the Versailles Treaty. Most Americans wanted to remain isolationist after the war. They didn't want anything to do with European countries, whatever their disagreements. The Versailles Treaty did not pass in the Senate because there were a lot of senators who did not like Wilson and didn't want to be involved in signing any agreements with any foreign countries. Wilson lobbied so hard for the treaty that he suffered a, a stroke and was never an effective president after that. And I put this in here because there's something happening that's going to come to a head later in what we call the Cold War. And it's the rise of the fear of communism. Uh, I mentioned to my class here in Ecuador, I, I wrote a paper, a long paper, just a couple months ago, last spring, uh, about that the Cold War actually starts before World War I with the conflict between uh, the industrialists in all the countries that are industrialized and the workers. And in the 1880s and 1890s, you have a lot of uh, terror, what we, today we call terrorists. In those days, they called them anarchists, uh, bomb attacks and anarchist protesting, labor unionists break, closing factories, government supporting the imperial, the, the, supporting the industrialists and the capitalists against the workers. By the end of the First World War, you've got something what we call the Red Scare, where the Americans were also paranoid about Eastern European uh, immigrants in particular coming into the United States with their ideas of socialism, because they had red marks, and communism, they had red marks. They were led by a gentleman, his name was Eugene Debs, and there was an American Communist Party that wanted to take down the democratic system and the capitalist system as being abusive and create the socialist and eventually the communist utopia that was promised in Marxism. It didn't work. Uh, some guys here, Sacco and Vanzetti, you should read about that. It was interesting. They were convicted of bank robbing and murder, and with uh, probably wrongly convicted, but were electrocuted. And you can find a very interesting YouTube on socialism and communism. It's done by the Khan Academy. Sal Khan explains socialism and communism and the rise of it. And it's important because now you have in, U in Russia, you have something called the Soviet Union by 1923, taken over by Joseph Stalin, creating the Soviet People's Workers' Utopia. And, and people believe it in the 1920s and 30s. In conclusion, the Americans suffered the trauma of World War I. And when I was a kid, I used to know an old man in Kentucky who had been on, in combat in World War I, and he showed me his helmet and his gas mask, and I remember that. People, I, uh, people ridiculed Wilson, Wilson for being an idealist and not, not pragmatic about the way human nature was. And was it the war to end all wars? Not by far. I don't think we'll ever end wars. Good night.